Welcome back. Uh, if you remember from our last video, we finished discussing the geography of South Asia. So in this video, we will discuss the physical and historical geographies of the Middle East and North Africa, also called MENA. Now MENA sits really in the heartland of trade and development around the Mediterranean and Western Asia. Its geographic proximity to Europe, Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa has had a profound impact on its history and development. Now currently there are 21 recognized countries in this region with two unrecognized semi-independent territories. Included in this list of countries, of recognized countries, are Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Sudan, South Sudan, Yemen, Oman, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Jordan, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Turkey, and Iran. Now, Morocco claims ownership of Western Sahara and Palestine, also called West Bank and Gaza, is not recognized by many countries around the world. These unrecognized territories are often hotbeds for violent clashes between neighboring armies as well. Now this map is satellite imagery from Google Earth. Um, located off the western coast of Africa is the Atlantic Ocean, uh, which plays a major role in international transportation. Now bordering northern Morocco are the Atlas Mountains, which impact the climate of southern Morocco and northwest, northwestern Algeria. The Sahara is the largest desert in the world and spans the lat latitudinal distance of North Africa from west to east, including uh, if the Red Sea weren't here, it would also include the Arabian Desert. Now the Mediterranean Sea sits to the north of Africa and also acts as a transportation highway for goods and people between Europe and North Africa. The Nile River, located here, cuts through the eastern half of Egypt and splits into the Blue Nile to the east and the White Nile to the south. The White Nile begins in Lake Victoria, down here off of the map, in Tanzania, and the Blue Nile begins in Lake Tana in Ethiopia. And so you can see uh, those lakes here. Here's Lake Victoria. And I'll have to find Lake Tana. There it is. So this is where uh, both versions or both uh, both sides of the Nile split. They actually uh, split in Khartoum, as you can see right here, where the Nile River becomes the White Nile and the Blue Nile here to the east. Now the Tigris and Euphrates River, located here, splits down the middle of Iraq, cutting it into two halves. Now these rivers and the Nile play an important role in development of early societies especially. Now the Red Sea, uh, located here, uh, sits to the west of the Arabian Peninsula and the Persian Gulf sits to the east, located here. While the Arabian Desert can be a harsh environment with very little water. It contains roughly 35 million people who are able to live off these resources. And finally, the Indian Ocean sits to the east of Africa and connects the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. It also acts as an international highway for resources and goods. Now, unfortunately, the Middle East and North Africa is such a large region that it would be impossible to cover all of its physical features. Okay, so before we get started, let's watch this quick clip from National Geographic titled Beneath Iran's Dusty Desert Lie Ancient Water Tunnels Still in Use. There are a lot of canals in Iran, and 
It is estimated that the length of this cannot is the same as the distance between the Earth and the Moon. It takes its name from the Semitic word meaning to dig. These structures are horizontal tunnels with a gentle slope that partly cuts through the aquifer and drains underground water from saturated layers. Then flows on the ground, transfers to different areas near and far to irrigate farmlands and pastures. Mr. Nabipur, with 102 years old, is considered as the oldest and the most experienced Mirab, a person who is in charge of the water distribution system. To residents, he is also the oldest teacher who has dedicated his life to preserve cannots and to train people throughout his life. This cannot, my life and my life, yet to nestle and nestle me with the wife of my daughter, and after the end, I will not be able to do this. My life is a cannot. I am a married person, and I am a married person. For a few years later, at that time, he is still concerned about maintaining this cultural grand heritage and transferring it to the next generation. Living in the desert and knowing the harshness there, he is completely aware of the importance and value of this cultural grand heritage as a system that is getting life from nature and giving it back in harmony with nature. Um, as you can see from that video, water is an important resource um, in the Middle East uh, and North Africa region and plays a significant role in cultural development. Now just like water resources, um, other attributes of the region's physical landscape play an important role in society. The Middle East and North Africa is located at the conjunction of the Indian, Arabian, Eurasian, Anatolian, African, and I Iberian plates, making it one of the most geologically active regions in the world behind Southeast Asia. Now there are at least 14 volcanoes in Turkey alone, making it an extremely active country. The interaction between the Eurasian and uh, Arabian plate has created folds in Iran and created the Fertile Crescent Valley around the Tigris and Euphrates. Now the map on the upper right here shows the interaction of plate boundaries uh, labeled in red, as you can see here and the subsequent creation of the physical landscape of that region, as you can see along the borders of these, of these tectonic boundaries, you have a number of mountain chains that, chains that develop. Now the map on the bottom right, located here, shows aggregated seismic activity in southern Europe and northern Africa. Now areas in red have high frequency frequencies in earthquakes and seismic activities, and this is due to the convergence of several plate tectonics in the region. Now this map gives a closer view of tectonics and faulting in the Middle East and North Africa and most of these faults shown here are thrust faults. So the thrust fault occurs along convergent boundaries as boundaries push towards each other uh, the less dense plate is forced over the top of the other plate at less than 45 degrees. Now eventually the less dense layer, as you can see here, folds over the top of the other layer, forming mountains. Uh, a couple of examples of this are the Atlas Mountains, which you can see a little bit more closely here. You can actually see the folds that occur in the Atlas Mountains here. And the other example is the Zagros Mountains, located here 
in Iran. And you get a better view of that here. Uh, as you can see, uh, a series of linear mountains that form this larger mountain chain. And this is essentially what folding has occurred along these, along these faults. So let's go back to the last slide uh, and take a look at faulting in MENA. Now in this map you can see that the African plate is expanding northward here. As the Iberian plate pushes southward, there is uh, a divergent force located here at the base of the Mediterranean that is pushing towards both plates. Now the force had, this force has created these uh, Atlas Mountains in Morocco to the south, as you can see here. They've also created these mountains here in Iberia. Now as a series of faults occur in, in and around Turkey here, uh, effectively creating its uh, mountainous landscape, and you can see that in real time here, located uh, uh, in the Anatolian Peninsula. Notice that the faults uh, near Libya and Egypt are located in the Mediterranean. Because these faults are underwater, they have resulted in a raised seafloor out from the coast, as you can tell here. Here is that raised seafloor. Now this shallow part of the Mediterranean would allow the Egyptians, Phoenicians, and the Romans to build a, a sophisticated deep water port system with less, with less effort required than in other areas with deeper waters. Now these two maps uh, show uh, a little bit more detail of the Middle East portion of this larger region. As you can see in the map on the left, tectonic forces from all directions uh, have created a plateau out of the Anatolian Peninsula, seen in the elevation model on the right, as we can see there. Uh, the Arabian and Nubian shields surround the, uh, the Red Sea to the south and act as the origin point for geological formations in, the, in this portion of the Middle East. Now shields are areas of exposed Precambrian crystalline igneous and high-grade metamorphic rocks that form tectonically stable areas, or in other words, these are ancient areas of rock formations and are likely the starting point for geological production. Now, the thrust fault that occurs in the southern part of Iran, located here, has resulted in the formation of the Zagros Mountains, as you can see here. Now, as you can see from the elevation model on the right, the orogenic belt of mountain folds has created a linear set of mountains blocking Iran from Iraq. Now, this has also had a major impact on weather and climate in this area as well. Now finally, in the Arabian and Eurasian plates, uh, as the Arabian and Eurasian plates converge, a valley is formed in Iraq around the Tigris and Euphrates River. And you can get a better view of that here to the right on Google Maps. You can imagine this like a sheet of paper. Now if you hold both ends of this and push from both sides, you notice that the edges of the paper will stay elevated while the center of the paper will push downward to form a valley. Now this is similar to what has happened uh, to create this Fertile Crescent Valley that has had such an historical importance in the development of society. All right, climate has had a major impact on historical development in this region as well. Physical landscapes and latitudes have created a region wrought by low rainfall and poor soil. While this is not true for many areas in MENA, a large portion of this region remains far too dry for crop growth. Now, the region is, uh, this region is located near the Tropic of Cancer. And due to the sun's general trajectory, MENA sits beneath a high-pressure trough that forces precipitation away from this region. Uh, because of a lack of rainfall in this region, two-thirds of all water is lost due to evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration is defined as the water lost to the atmosphere from the ground surface. 
evaporation from capillary fringe of the groundwater table, and the transportation of groundwater by plants whose roots tap the capillary fringe of the groundwater table. Now because transpir uh, transpiration goes up as temperature increases and relative humidity declines, this hot desert region across much of MENA loses most of its water. Now this has a major effect on food production and life expectancy in this region as well. A lack of precipitation in poor sandy soils has led to a dependence on rivers and aquifers. In fact, major cities in this region are all based around river systems and use aquifers to sustain their population. Now, on a side note, many, many people ask why a location like the West Bank in Palestine is so important to someone like Israel. Now, while this area is an important location because of its proximity to markets, let's zoom in over here so you can get a better view of this. Here's the West Bank. This is the Gaza Strip. Why is this particular area so important to Israel? Uh, the West Bank has an important aquifer that is used by Israel to feed its population. Currently, Israel possesses this aquifer and does not allow Palestine to control its own water resources. Now this slide shows a diagram of the global atmospheric circulation that helps to explain the desert regions that occur globally around this 30 degree north latitude. Let's find a latitudinal map so you can get a better idea of this. Unfortunately, these maps are all low resolution, so we'll take what we can get. Okay, so the 30 degree line is right here, and we'll go just to double check that. They don't even have it labeled. Well, just trust me for right now. This is the 30 degree latitude right now. Um, it uh, crosses Morocco, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iran and it creates a massive desert region. According to the theory of atmospheric circulation, the vertical Hadley cells, you can see here, and you can also see here, uh, meets the feral cell, shown here and shown here as well, um, at the 30 degree latitude mark, and both cells push toward, each, uh, toward the surface, pushing precipitation out away from this region towards the tropics and the, lat uh, the uh, mid-latitudes. And you can see a visual of that here. You imagine that this being the 30 degree line of latitude, uh, Hadley cells down here meet the feral cells located here. As both systems push downward uh, in this particular direction and towards one another, you see this high pressure trough that develops here pushing air away so that precipitation is not attracted to this area. All right, so the rain shadow effect uh, also has uh, helped to further exasperate the lack of precipitation in North Africa. Notice the map on the bottom right. To make this a little bit bigger. Uh, notice this map. Uh, in theory, the North Atlantic Drift and the Canary Currents, located here, North Atlantic Drift, Canary Currents, uh, would bring north this portion of North Africa on the west coast moist air. Uh, this moist air should approach the coast of Morocco and provide rain for a large portion of northwestern Africa. But because of the Atlas Mountains, shown in this satellite image right here, um, all of the moisture is released at, as the air moves over the mountain range. Now the diagram on the top left here explains the process of orographic precipitation. As moist oceanic air rises over the coast, it releases some of its moisture right here. Once it reaches the Atlas Mountains, it rises to, in altitude quickly and temperatures decline rapidly. When temperature declines, 
uh, relative humidity increases. Once the air reaches its lifting condensation level, all moisture is released in the form of precipitation. The resulting air that makes it over these mountain ranges uh, is dry at, and as it falls in altitude, temperatures increase much quicker than they would if the air was moist. The result in, uh, the, this results in the formation of a desert on the opposing side or the leeward side of the mountain located here. Let's take a look at uh, earth.null school and we can see how this interacts. So if we look at this map here, we, and we've looked at this before, you can do a number of functions, uh, but you get an idea. Uh, in theory, these, these, this coastal air should be moist and should provide precipitation for much, much of this part of North Africa. But as you can tell, this air is circulating rather than continuing to go inland. And there's a reason why. So the Atlas Mountains are located here and you can literally see the Atlas Mountains. Uh, this air circulates, hits the mountains, and then dissipates and almost disappears. So no longer does, uh, does the air, the moist, the moist air from the ocean enter in and create precipitation in this part of North Africa, but it, uh, it just essentially cycles around northern Morocco. Let's see if we can find a better map. We'll go over here to the bottom and we'll go to uh, temperatures. You can also see temperatures here. As the air comes, uh, in theory, you would think that the air would be warmer uh, if you got closer to the equator, but because of uh, orographic precipitation and resulting rain shadow effect, uh, the air as it goes over this mountain and loses all its all of its moisture, it rises in temperature, and so you it results in some of the hottest areas on Earth. Of course, it's not always the hottest areas. You also have high heat here as well, uh, but you have to keep in mind that this particular part of the Earth is is one of the hottest deserts that exists. And then we can look at relative humidity, and you see that. You can just see the impact of both latitude from the Hadley cell and the Farrell cell coming in contact here, uh, and also orographic precipitation. All of this humidity has been released. And then we go to uh, total cloud, or excuse me, total precipitation water, and you can see that here as well a very dry landscape. Now this map shows the average annual rainfall in MENA. As you can see from most of the region, uh, that it has less than 10 inches of rain a year. Morocco, Turkey, Iran, coastal Syria, Lebanon, and, and Israel receive m the most rainfall in the region. Now if you take into account both rainfall and temperatures, then you can somewhat evaluate these climate zones, excuse me, evaluate the climate zones of this region. So this map shows the climate biomes of MENA. Most of the region is considered desert or semi-arid, as you can see here in the yellow. Uh, because of the latitude of this region, climates are heavily dependent on access to moist coastal air, except for the extreme southern portion of South Sudan, you can see here. Unfortunately, this map is several years old and extremely simplistic, so it doesn't show enough detail. Uh, and it also excludes South Sudan. But as you can see on the southern portion of Sudan, there is a small region of tropical climates. Now, most of the mid-latitudes along the coast are considered Mediterranean climates, uh, which means that they receive more rainfall in the winter than during the summer. Uh, but of course, here it labels them as mid-latitude. Now, the next slide should give you uh, maybe a better idea of the climates of these, of these particular climate zones. Let's make this a little bit bigger so you get a better view of it. Now, this sh slide shows four main climates that exist across MENA. Now, the climate graph here on the upper left is Tunis, Tunisia, and is an example of a Mediterranean climate. Notice that temperatures are warmer by 15 degrees Celsius during the summer compared to the winter. It receives most of its rain during the winter months, as you can see here. And Tunisia is located here, and there is the city of Tunis, as you can see there. Now, um, 
Riyadh, Saudi Arabia on the upper right, located here, is considered a semi-arid climate and temperatures fluctuate between 15 degrees Celsius in the winter and 35 degrees in the summer. It, received, uh, it receives very little rain throughout the year with most of its precipitation occurring between February and May, as you can see there. Let's go see where Riyadh is located. And as you can see, Riyadh is located in the center of the Arabian Desert. Now, Juba, South Sudan, is in the lower left, located here, in a, uh, is in a uh, tropical monsoon climate, and temperatures remain stable pretty much year-round. As uh, it, it receives a massive amount of rain for seven months, as you can see here, um, its dry season occurs uh, largely due to the ITCZ as it moves away, uh, away from North Africa and into Southern Africa. Let's find out where that is located. And there's Juba, located in a uh, what is considered to be either a tropical savanna or a tropical monsoon. And finally, uh, you see uh, Owalin Borge, Algeria, uh, which is a true desert climate where temperatures fluctuate between 16 degrees in the winter and 37 degrees in the summer. It receives about 8 millimeters of rain during its rainy season in August and September. So let's find that on the map. Okay, so that, that gives you a general idea. Here is, uh, um, I don't think that's Oline Borge, but just uh, we'll keep this in mind. Oline Borge is very, is very similar to the desert, desert climates that are located here in some of these oases. So just keep that in mind. Um, because of the lack of water and relatively poor soil of inland MENA, much of the region is highly dependent on river systems for crops. Now this satellite image here provides some context for this reality. Notice that the greenest areas in MENA are near coastal regions and river systems. So let's go look at this, uh, look at, look at uh, Google Maps a little bit closer so that we can get a better idea. Uh, one of the most prominent rivers in the region is the, of course the Nile River and as you can see the Nile River feeds a broad majority of and I mean broad it's upwards at 90 percent of the of the cities in Egypt and for a very important reason this uh, this river uh, has not only helped to feed the current modern day society of Egypt but this particular climate also helped to feed uh, the entire empire of Rome as it became the grain capital of the Roman Empire. And as you can see, it's surrounded by deserts um, with greenery following as you get further and further north. And you can see that here. Um, irrigation is also a major source of, of water in these areas as well. Another important region, and you can see this, not as prevalent uh, from satellite imagery, but as you get closer to these river systems, you see uh, land, uh, land use changes dramatically from the surrounding region. You can also see that here in these sort of um, feeder, feeder lakes as well. And of course, as you get uh, closer and closer to the coastline, you can see the, uh, the land use and land cover change dramatically. I think we often assume places like uh, Israel, for example, is just a desert wasteland because of the region that it's located in. But in fact, um, it is a fairly, fairly fertile area with uh, large amounts of agriculture and forests as well. And you can actually see that here in parts of North Africa too. So we go to Tunisia, and m most of northern Tunis, where most of the population lives, is uh, covered in farmlands and types of forests. And you can really even see that in modern day Morocco as well. You see the land cover here, very different from land cover 
in the rest of Morocco, Algeria, and Libya. Okay, uh, because of the lack of water in this region, inland areas depend on aquifers for fresh water. I'll make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. Now an aquifer is a body of porous rock or sediment uh, saturated with groundwater. Now groundwater enters an aquifer as precipitation and seeps uh, through the soil. It can move through the aquifer and resurface through springs and wells. Now this map was released by the United Nations in 2008 after the Convention on Transboundary Aquifers. It's a little old, but it's still useful. The blue here represents aquifers and groundwater that has been recorded. The green, located along these coastlines and in settled areas, um, represents uh, either major river systems or irrigation systems uh, used in agriculture. Now the tan represents areas with shallow aquifers or limited water resources. Now areas with red lines, and you can see those zones here, um, have irrigation, uh, irrigated to the point of salinization. As you can see here, areas of saline groundwater. Uh, in other words, massive irrigation systems have introduced salt water into the freshwater basin. Now this has long-term negative impacts on local plants, animals, and agricultural production. Now the red figures, and you can see those here, uh, represent areas of groundwater mining or areas of heavy groundwater abstraction over, uh, with over-exploitation. Essentially meaning that these areas are at risk of the disappearance of water resources. Now the water conflict theory argues that the ultimate cause of many of the world's conflicts are due to control over water resources. Some scholars have argued that this is the primary reason uh, Palestine is so important to Israel. As stated earlier, Israel controls the West Bank's aquifers, making it difficult for the people there to get fresh water. Now, overgrazing and excessive irrigation and the massive use of aquifer wells in this region have led to desertification and salinization in many areas. A large portion of agriculture in the North Africa region is based around grazing cattle. Cattle requires grass for feed and an increased number of cattle can remove nutrients from the soil, leading to an increase in deserts. So this map uh, on the left here shows that the areas that are uh, vulnerable to desertification. And uh, so if you notice the areas closest to the desert uh, that are the most vulnerable. Now, why is the this particular area not as vulnerable? Well, it's kind of a trick question because it's already a desert. But that brings us to a, an even better question. Why are the areas closest to the desert more vulnerable than the ones further away? So the soil is already poor in nutrients in these areas and, is, and it's primarily gra uh, grassland. Um, as the number of cattle increases, uh, they eat up the grass and rain is required to regrow this grass. Now, if, if cattle eat grass faster than the rain can replenish it, these areas transform from grasslands to deserts pretty quickly. Our climate and geology have also played a major role in the key natural resources and land uses in MENA. Uh, with the second industrial revolution, outside powers became aware of the massive amounts of oil in this region. They would eventually find out that this area also contained an abundance of phosphates, uh, which is used in chemicals and fertilizers. So this map is aggregated uh, is an aggregated representation of natural resources and land use patterns across MENA. Now most of the region is used for nomadic herding or has limited activity. Coastal areas uh, use phosphate-based fertilizer in commercial farming, hence all the phosphate. Uh, phosphates located in coastal Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia here in this uh, circular representation. Now river systems largely feed subsistence or small-scale agriculture and the Mediterranean and Persian Gulf are major sources of fishing. 
uh, you can see these uh, these subsistence farms located here along the major major river systems in the Middle East, and also the light blue commercial fishing, which is a major major source of food and income for this area. Uh, notice that the number of oil well uh, the the high number of oil wells across the region. Now, natural gas or petroleum is a natural resource used to produce energy across the world and is a valuable resource at that. It is found trapped in the pores of sedimentary rock and requires the use of wells for extraction. Now, oil is a major source of income for this region and has brought, we uh, brought wealth to countries like Saudi Arabia, Oman, UAE, Qatar, Kuwait, um, and other places as well. However, because of this resource, European countries and the United States have really spurred conflict in this region since the Second Industrial Revolution. Now, there are also examples of, uh, of coal mining as well, uh, but most of the coal mining is located in the mountainous regions or the hills of Anatolia um, and uh, not, not too many circumstances of that existing across the desert region. The physical environment in Mina has also played a role in the establishment of culture in the region. Now this area is located is the location of the earliest known societies to develop on Earth. Unfortunately, there's not enough time to discuss really the entire history of this region, so we will have to limit our discussion to the origins of society, the Phoenicians, the rise of Islam, the Ottomans and European colonialism. Now, Mesopotamia is considered by most scholars to be the cultural hearth of modern of the modern world, and you can see that from this map over here on the right. Now, this just means that the first urban settlements formed in the basin of the Tigris and Euphrates here. Um, it's believed that this is where society really began. So called the Fertile Crescent because of the Tigris and Euphrates, this area is considered the cradle of civilization because it contains the world's oldest cities that have yet to have been discovered. Now the first society to develop here was probably the Sumerians around uh, 3000 BC. Uh, around that time, several city-states developed in modern-day Iraq. Uh, each city had temples and government structures. Uh, the earliest known cities to have political hierarchies. Now, major cities include Eridu, Uruk, Kish, and Ur, named after historical religious figures found in the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Enuma Elish. The Enuma Elish is a series of clay tablets with the earliest known forms of writing called cuneiform. Uh, it tells the story of human creation and the development of ancient Sumer. While many of these stories really seem fantastic, some archaeological discoveries have lent credence to some of these stories. Now, interestingly, in 1996, uh, German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt found a 1963 document discussing uh, an area known as Gobekli Tepe and decided to re-examine the site. He discovered a massive city that, uh, that had radiocarbon dated to 9000 BC, prior to the Younger Dryas impact. So we can get a better idea of that, and I think we touched on this a little bit before, but just as a reminder. Now, according to theory, the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis states that uh, somewhere around uh, 9,600 BC, so anywhere between 11,000 to 9,600 BC, um, either an asteroid or a comet made contact with uh, North America. At this time, North America was covered in a large ice sheet 
So when the comet made contact with this particular area, uh, it didn't form a crater. And it's believed that that site may be located near the Hudson Bay here as well. But it also, um, what it did is it uh, created an, a series of instantaneous melt glasses. So in other words, it threw off giant shards of ice uh, across the globe and eventually uh, caused the melting of masses of a massive amount of ice uh, becoming water and that water then uh, leaked into the ocean forcing a massive rise in ocean levels and global floodings. Now, this is quite amazing uh, because this site was uh, was had, had actually been covered by rocks on purpose, leading some people to speculate that these people knew that this Younger Dryas impact was coming. Now, this is what's interesting. Gobekli Tepe predates Sumer by 6,000 years, the only, and only about 10% of the site has been excavated. Now it's covered. Uh, it's covered in uh, beautifully carved uh, T-shaped stones, and has really baffled the archaeolo archaeological community since its discovery. Uh, Gobekli Tepe is located in the periphery of the Fertile Crescent. You can see that here on the map um, on the bottom left in modern-day Turkey, and we can get a better idea of that here. And here it is the archaeological site right here. And again, you can look at this massive site. This is only what is believed to be 10% uh, of that particular site. Um, from here to here is roughly about 1,000 feet. So there's really no telling how big this site could potentially be. And you can see that here in uh, Turkey near the Syrian border. Now, that, just because it's in Turkey doesn't mean that it's not also part of the Fertile Crescent. Uh, keep in mind that this is in that Fertile Crescent Basin. As you can see, um, here is uh, one of those uh, major historical rivers that feeds this particular area. So this may have also been part of, or at least a periphery city, um, that predates the Sumerian Empire or the Sumerian civilization. Now the picture in the top left is the center structure for the dig site and the picture on the top right is the carving of a reptilian or bird figure in one of these stones. So let's take a look at this video link from RT News, uh, T, excuse me, TRT News um, titled Gobekli Tepe Reveals Details of Early Human Life. It's believed to predate the pyramids and Stonehenge by thousands of years. Experts say when Gobekli Tepe was built in southeastern Turkey, it may have been used in rituals to commemorate the dead. How do we know this? On many of these pillars, there are animal figures, relics, and other different symbols. This was probably because the people of that time depicted these symbols and animals because they were afraid of them, or with the aim of making these animals guardians of temples. Humanity's oldest known temple was first located in 1963, during surveys overseen by universities in Chicago and Istanbul. A 4,000 square meter steel roof was erected to protect the site as researchers looked for traces of everyday life. In archaeological digs at Göbekli Tepe, six temples have been unearthed until now, but it was determined in aerial geo-radar scans that about 20 temples have been located. Excavations have been ongoing since Göbekli Tepe was discovered. Over the past year, new artifacts at the site have been unearthed. Organizers hope it will lead to renewed interest. It's amazing, yeah. It's like a highly spiritual area. Um, I can definitely sense like there's uh, uh, the heritage of the of the of humanity here. Archaeologists say work at the site is likely to continue for decades. You can see the massive size of these stones. It's absolutely amazing that uh, what is believed to be a semi-pastoral 
society with uh, small farmers could build such amazing structures. It's absolutely amazing. Now, several millennia later, the Phoenicians would set up a trading empire along the coast of the Mediterranean. This uh, civilization would originally begin as a set of loose merchants, uh, merchant city-states as Tyre of South Lebanon was written about in the histories of Herodotus and probably originated prior to 2200 BC. Now this would mark the beginning of shipping in the Mediterranean. Let's see if we can find uh, the modern city, Tyre. And that is located here. And as you can tell from some of these pictures, uh, these are some of the old stone structures. Of course, these are left over from a mixture of Greek, uh, in you can see at the top here, and then Phoen Phoenician uh, built stones here at the bottom. So, uh, the Phoenicians set up a series of shipping ports and urban structures along the coast of North Africa and would eventually establish a major city at Carthage, as you can see here, uh, which would become modern day Tunis, Tunisia. And we can, uh, again, get a, a good idea of where that is located here on the map. Here is, again, Tunisia and then Tunis where some of these ruins still exist today. Uh, during this era, Egypt would rise along the Nile River and trade with the Phoenicians. And proximity would really help out both empires. Um, Egyptian texts talk about a group uh, of seafaring people they called the Sea People. Um, recent evidence suggests that this was uh, Phoenician tra uh, trading ships uh, because of the goods that were being traded with the Egyptians. In fact, archaeologists discovered that the copper and tin used to make Egyptian bronze weapons um, matched the type of copper that came from ancient mines in Michigan in the United States. Uh, rune stones discovered in North America have primitive Phoenician characters carved into them that are similar to the merchant records uh, discovered around Europe. Um, another interesting discovery is the evidence of cocaine and tobacco in King Tut's system in a recent autopsy. This suggests that someone was trading drugs across the Atlantic. Nothing's new under the sun, correct? All right, so fast forward 1500 years, we see the rise of the Muhammad Caliphate and the founding of Islam. There is, a detailed, there is a detailed history here, so it would really be impossible for me to discuss the entire history of the period, so I'll try to keep it short. Uh, Muhammad was born probably in Mecca around 570 AD, but other scholars have stated that he was born probably in 568 or 569. Not much is known about his childhood, uh, but by 605, Muhammad would become a major figure in Arabia. Now, according to religious tradition, he was uh, he would walk through the gates of the Kaaba in Mecca and help to place the famous black stone in the Kaaba wall. So let's see if we can find this here. Kaaba, Mecca, Saudi Arabia, which we'll come back to and discuss in a little bit more detail later, located here. And if we zoom out, you can see where it is related to the rest of Saudi Arabia. So let's get a uh, let's do a street view so you can get a good good picture of this. Millions of visitors visit this site every year and pray to it as a uh, pilgrimage. So, uh, like I said before, uh, Muhammad would help to place the famous black stone that uh, that would sit in the Kaaba's wall for centuries. Now, this would start a five-year journey for Muhammad until he was approached by, according to the story, approached by the angel Gabriel, who would command him to recite the verses that would become the Quran. Now, this would begin his rise to power. By 630, Muhammad and his 10,000-man army would storm Mecca and take control. 
His army would continue to grow in numbers, and by his death in 632, the Islamic army would control the entire Arabian Peninsula. Now, after his death, an argument ensued over his successor, Abu Bakr, which was Muhammad's friend, uh, would be chosen as his, his successor and would lead the Rashidun Caliphate, which would expand the Islamic Caliphate's territory across the Middle East and half of North Africa. Um, a small number of Muhammad's followers rejected Abu Bakr and claimed that the successor should be related to Muhammad. So Al Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, was a cousin and son-in-law of Muhammad, and those who rejected Abu Bakr wanted Ali to take the throne. This would mark the beginning of the split in Islam between Shias, um, who believe Ali was the true successor, and Sunnis, who believe Abu Bakr was the rightful heir. Now, after the death of, the, of Muhammad, the Rashid, Rashidun uh, Caliphate would extend its territory. Now, this would, make a, uh, this would make a period of conflict between Shias and Sunnis over the control of the empire and Islam. The Rashidun uh, Caliphate was largely Sunni, but would end in 661, shortly after Ali took the throne. After the fall of the Rashidun Caliphate, the split in Islam became more prevalent and both sides went to war. Uh, the Umayyad Caliphate would begin in 661 and after uh, the war was completed, it would establish Sunni policies. Now it would expand its territory across North Africa and invade southern Spain, as you can see in this map here. Uh, it would also expand eastward into Central Asia, uh, Asian steppe here, and make, uh, make it to the border of the Eastern Roman Empire in Anatolia. Now some people call this the Ottoman Empire, or excuse me, the uh, uh, either Constantinople or the Byzantine Empire, I prefer to call it the Eastern Roman Empire because it was part of the continuous rise and fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, the Abbasid uh, Caliphate would overthrow the, the Umayyads in 750 and eventually establish its capital in Baghdad. And we can see Baghdad here, located in the Fertile Crescent. This, uh, this period would, be a, would become a golden age of culture in Iraq and Persia. Now, of course, the Umayyads would continue for another century in uh, southern Spain uh, as the Abbasids uh, uh, took control of the Umayyad throne. The, uh, later, the, the Fatimid uh, Caliphate would rise to power in 909 as the Seljuk Turks invaded northern Abbasid territory. Uh, the Fatimids established Shia policies and would uh, control much of North Africa and Egypt and a portion of Western Arabia. By 1200, the uh, Eastern Roman Empire in Anatolia was in major decline and had been decimated by the Knights Templars during the Crusades. Their defenses were quickly decaying and a series of inept rulers would lead to the eventual destruction of the millennium-old empire. In 1302, uh, Osman, uh, which would become known as Osman the Great, or Othman the Great, uh, where the term Ottoman comes from, which was a mispronunciation by Western Europeans, um, Osman would become the, uh, would be the, uh, would, would lead the Ottoman Turks to invade Nicaea and would eventually defeat the Eastern Roman Empire. By 1308, his army would take a large portion of Roman territory. Now, Ottoman territory would continue to grow until 1453 when Sultan Mehmet II would lay siege and take control of Constantinople, putting an end to the Eastern Roman Empire. The Ottoman Empire would grow in size until it controlled most of southeastern Europe, Anatolia, the Fertile Crescent, most of North Africa, Egypt, and one-fourth of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, it would cease to exist after World War I, and England would split its territory uh, among tribal leaders loyal to the British crown. Now, while the Ottoman Empire was expanding across North Africa, European powers met 
at, uh, at the Berlin Conference in 1884 to divide most of Africa amongst itself. Now France controlled Algeria um, and would take control of Tunisia as well. The British controlled Yemen, Oman, and Egypt and then would eventually, uh, eventually take Sudan. Now Spain would, would take Libya before World War I and keep it until the end of World War II. The European powers were closing in on the Ottomans while their empire was declining from the inside. In 1914, the Ottomans would ally with Germany and Austria-Hungary against the British, French, and Russia during World War I. Now, World War I was planned by the British long before the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Bosnia in 1914. Uh, prior to the war, Germany had signed an agreement with the Ottoman Empire to build a railroad uh, for oil out of modern-day Iraq and Arabia. This would effectively give Germany control over oil in mainland Europe. If we take a look at this map here, um, essentially, this railroad would connect oil resources out of modern-day Iraq, follow up the Tigris and Euphrates River, go through Turkey, cross uh, the Bosporus and Dardanelles, which just to give you an idea of that, this is the Bosporus uh, located right here. <clears throat> this is why Istanbul, Constantinople before that, and Byzant uh, Byzantium before that, is such an important location as it really controls trade uh, in uh, between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, uh, making it uh, making anybody that is located here on the coast of the Black Sea essentially somewhat subservient to whoever controls this particular area, which it, it current. Uh, currently is Turkey. So there was an agreement to build this railroad uh, from Germany uh, to, uh, excuse me, from Iraq through Turkey, up through Bulgaria, then the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and then finally into Germany. This would effectively give Germany uh, a monopoly on most of the oil as it was transported into mainland Europe. Of course, Britain wasn't going to let this happen. Uh, they, had, they had actually made an agreement with tribal leaders in Arabia that if they helped the, in the battle against the Ottomans, uh, Britain would, uh, would back the creation of a Wahhabi-controlled Arabia and transport oil through the Suez Canal. And many of these tribal leaders weren't happy with, uh, with the way that Turkey was ruling over them. And as you can see here, here is the Suez Canal. So there were, there were two potential options here. Either a railroad gets built through Turkey up into Germany. Germany effectively controls, uh, controls oil, uh, oil shipments to mainland Europe. Or uh, an, an Arabian sort of empire gets created here, ships it over the seas through the Suez Canal up, and through, uh, up through the... Uh, the Mediterranean, and then eventually into London. And, uh, and, and uh, around this time as well, uh, Gibraltar was, had been ceded and controlled by Britain as well. So effectively, if Britain could effectively stop the, the, the production and building of this railroad, then they could effectively take control of the oil resources into mainland Europe and essentially the rest of the world because of their massive navy. Now, after um, the agreement was signed uh, between France and the UK, uh, which becomes known as the Sykes-Picot Agreement, <clears throat> and the war was over, Britain would control most of Iraq, Jordan, and Palestine, uh, later, renamed, later renamed Israel. Now, France would control part of Turkey, Syria, and Lebanon, uh, as you can see in this map here. Now, after the agreement went into a, uh, went into effect, several Arab tribes revolted. Uh, the British kept to their agreement, and the Wahhabi House of Saud would uh, take control of Arabia, and renaming it Saudi Arabia. Now, Britain would now have access to the oil resources and reserves that they needed in order to control Europe's 
energy consumption. Okay, so that's about it for us today. Uh, thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.